welcome everybody to this session of the 7th Berwick Literary Festival. My name is Philip Moore and I'm one of the Literary Festival's trustees and your host for this session, in which Steve Richards will talk about his critically acclaimed book, reflecting on the leadership qualities and skills needed in a British Prime Minister and the extent to which uh, these have been shown, or in many cases not shown, uh, by leaders from Harold Wilson uh, through to Boris Johnson. Traditionally, our Saturday evening events at the Berwick Festival um, take place in the splendid surroundings of Berwick's Georgian Town Hall with a glass of wine to accompany the excellent um, presentation. Unfortunately, this year I can't offer you the glass of wine, um, but I know that you will find um, this evening a thoroughly enjoyable and stimulating session. And one of the advantages of being in uh, the internet age and, um, and, and in the midst of a pandemic is that while we can't be together, we are joined through the internet by people from all around the world during this evening. Steve Richards is a broadcaster and political commentator who's written for The Guardian, The Independent, The Statesman and uh, Spectator. Having covered politics for over 20 years for the BBC in print and on the live stage, not least as a presenter of the, the BBC's excellent Week in Westminster programme, Steve is able to examine British politics with the, um, and the insider knowledge um, uh, um, of somebody who knows this political system and, its, and those who are actors on it, in, in it, um, uh, sharpened with very considerable wit. His book, The Prime Minister's Reflections on Leadership from Wilson through to Johnson, um, is a masterly, a masterly um, uh, uh, presentation um, of a, a survey of all our prime ministers since Harold Wilson, um, three of whom, incidentally, it's been my privilege to serve in one capacity or another. The book was first published in 2019, but has recently been republished in an extended paperback edition. What um, in the book, uh, Steve attempts to answer the question, what combination of qualities and circumstances enables someone to be a successful British prime minister? His book has been widely and deservedly praised by commentators and journalists alike. Thank you very much for giving up your time to chair this session and thank you all for watching. I'll speak for about 15 minutes if that's okay and then we can have a much wider discussion. I suppose the reason I wrote the book uh, was for, well there were two reasons really, uh, two main reasons. One was that for all the focus in British politics and British media culture on leaders, and there is a focus almost to the extent that we have a kind of presidential culture in a party-based system, which is problematic, I think. For all that focus, we rarely step back and reflect on what are the qualifications for leadership. Um, there are wholly legitimate ideological questions from the left and right when people choose leaders, but rarely, are the wider qualifications addressed? And I'll come on to those in a minute. And the second reason was that as a journalist with the supposedly impartial BBC, with a commentate as a columnist mixing with other columnists, I found that too often in the media, we dealt with cliches. We fell too often for caricatures and stereotypes which um, didn't actually add up and make sense, that these people were more complicated and interesting than all the adjectives that get bandied around when commentators gather in a broadcasting studio or anywhere else, a book festival. Strong, weak, clearly they're losing their mind, uh, incompetent, uh, modernizer. These terms are ubiquitous and yet utterly distorting to the point of becoming meaningless. And each of the characters I looked at from Wilson to Johnson 
are more complicated and therefore more interesting. So I wanted to challenge orthodoxies and also look at what are those qualifications. And briefly, when you think about it, the demands of leadership uh, in the current era, and by the way, I define the period as the modern era, Wilson to May. Um, I know, knew some of them quite well, the, the later ones, I hasten to add, but even those from way back, Wilson and Heath, um, I met, uh, uh, Heath I met and uh, interviewed quite a few times, went long after he had retired and was just loathing Thatcher. Um, and Wilson I saw from a distance as a kid. Um, but some of the others I got to know very well. It is almost impossible, I think, to meet the demands of a modern prime minister. If you step back and think about it, you have to have a sense of how to govern, how the structures are in Britain work, where power lies, what levers to pull. The policies you adopt not only have to be effective in inverted commas, but have to relate to the values of your party and then somehow or other to the wider electorate or else you will lose an election. You have to manage a party which these days is almost impossible. The Labour Party has always been incredibly difficult to lead and is sometimes unleadable. The Tory party used to be much easier to lead, but now that too, with Europe and other divisions, uh, very, very difficult to lead. You have to respond to an around the clock media, um, making demands, creating a sense sometimes of wholly artificial, hysterical pressure, um, not just broadcasting rolling news, but Twitter. All the leaders are on Twitter and they follow it obsessively. These are huge demands. And then, of course, you widen it to foreign affairs. And it's very interesting, the number of prime ministers in the end who become sucked up by foreign affairs and fall sometimes in relation to foreign affairs. Most of them have given it virtually no thought in advance to becoming leaders. Um, so these are some of the qualifications of leadership, which when you think about it, are fairly obvious. And yet look at the criteria applied when parties elect leaders. Johnson, none of that really applied. They elected him because they were worried about the future of the Tory party, the rise of Farage and Brexit, and they thought he could take Farage on and return the Tories to electability. Now that was a calculation that has proven to be wholly right. But what about the other demands of leadership? Even some of those who appeared in some respects at ease with power arrived there with no experience whatsoever of government. Blair in 97 had not even been a PPS, not his fault. Labour were in opposition all the time he had been an MP. Cameron, uh, Prime Minister in the midst of that economic drama post the crash, no min ministerial experience whatsoever. Nick Clegg, his deputy, had only been an MP for a few years. Now, if you think about it in the context of, say, any other vocation, take theatre, and by the way, politics is very theatrical. Um, if somebody walked off the street to a theatre uh, and the director was sitting there and, and this person says, I'd quite like to play Hamlet tomorrow, uh, the director will probably say, well, have you played King, I mean, have you got any experience? And if that person said no, that person would not be playing Hamlet. In our current political culture, where with all respect to theatre and Hamlet, the stakes are much higher, it's almost an advantage uh, these days to play up your inexperience. Look at Trump. Who, what, not this time, four years ago, I've got nothing to do with Washington. Uh, that's an establishment I despise. Oh yeah, we'll vote for him. Um, it's voting for putting on stage a Hamlet who's never acted before. So th these are some of the interesting qualifications. What makes a successful prime minister? Now success takes many different forms. 
One is deeply subjective. If you're on the left, on the whole, you will uh, choose Clem Attlee. Some on the right choose Clem Attlee. If you're on the right, you choose Thatcher. But I didn't want to do a book from my own personal political perspectives because 25,000 of those are written a day, although you might be able to guess sometimes where I stand from my assessments, but that wasn't the plan. Um, the plan was to look at other things. So, for example, it seems to me to be an election winner, which is clearly an objective criteria for success. You have to be a political teacher. You have to make sense of what you're doing, even if what you're doing is sometimes nonsensical. So the three big election winners uh, in the book are Harold Wilson, who always used to show off, I won four elections out of five. And he did, oh, very close, some of them, but he did, um, which is an, an astonishing achievement given that Labour usually loses elections. Uh, then Thatcher, who won three elections, including two stonking landslides, and then Tony Blair, who won three elections. All very different as individuals and as prime ministers. And yet they were all teachers. They were able to tell the wider electorate why they were doing what they were doing. Um, now, this why question is really interesting. Most politicians don't do it. If you look at the Jeremy Corbyn leadership, you know, he was mobbed at his peak and crowds chanting as if he was a great orator. He never addressed the why question. He would announce one policy after another as if that in itself was an explanation. Um, uh, other, Theresa May couldn't answer the why question uh, even if she had decided to pose it, which she didn't. They were not teachers and they were not election winners. Uh, whereas Wilson, certainly at his peak, would uh, sound forward-looking, the white-hot heat of the technological revolution harnessed by the state. So he brought together uh, the left of his party who were excited by the role of the state, but those who were looking ahead with technological change. He was constantly doing that and often talking about the price of things. If you vote Labour, you'll get cheaper bread and butter. And that was literally the plan because they subsidised bed, bread, butter and milk in the mid 70s. Um, but people thought, oh, yeah, we're worried about prices. Here's someone talking about why he's doing this. Uh, Thatcher was an instinctive teacher. Um, monetarism, this incredibly complex and in many ways punitive economic policy, uh, uh, explained by in the late 70s, my father in Grantham, in his shop, never spent more than he earned, and a country cannot spend more than it earns. And people, oh yeah, amidst all this late 70s chaos, she's talking a lot of sense here. You, now, actually, the state is very different from a grocer's shop, but she tried to explain why she was advocating, in effect, pretty tough spending cuts to come, uh, in a way that made a kind of accessible sense. And Blair too, constantly teaching uh, press conferences around the clock. You know, I'm on the radical center, right? So if you want change, I'm radical. If you want reassurance, I'm on the center. Constantly trying to explain where he was and why he was there. Now you could disagree with each of the explanations, but there was an attempt to teach and they were the big winners. They weren't necessarily the deepest policy thinkers. I don't think they were. Um, and interestingly, uh, those who delve deep in terms of policy in the book uh, were not, uh, had very turbulent times at number 10. Uh, Gordon Brown was a deep thinker. He was a deeper thinker than Tony Blair, but incredibly well read, deep sense of history. Uh, an extraordinarily successful student at Edinburgh University. And if you went to see him for a coffee, you didn't really say very much, but he would talk to you about everything. The theology of capitalism, based on a conversation he had just had with the Archbishop, the depths of where markets work and where they don't. And so he was a deep thinker, but as we all recall, had a 
tempestuous time in number 10. And Heath too was a, uh, I mean, he was an erratic thinker, but he was capable of deep thought. I mean, you might disagree with him on Europe, but it was an epic achievement of policy making and understanding to get Britain in, in 73. Um, uh, whether you agree with this or not, he was capable of delving deep and he had range based on his upbringing in the 1930s and so on. And yet they were not electorally successful. So those are two examples of kind of interesting applications, I think, I hope, of the kind of criteria for leadership and who then met them. I'll just conclude with this, with Boris Johnson, who uh, there's a whole additional chapter on him in the paperback uh, because the, uh, the hardback finished on the day Theresa May fell from power. Johnson breaks all the assumptions we have had about leadership and prime ministers. Uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Let's give a couple of examples. All prime ministers, and they're all completely unique, but all of them in this book, when faced with leadership in a hung parliament, which is a form of political hell, all did the same thing, however different they were in character. They all tried to woo their own MPs, to woo MPs from smaller parties in an attempt to govern. Uh, so to give you the examples, uh, Jim Callaghan, very tribal as a Labour Prime Minister, formed a pact with the Liberals. Cameron formed a coalition with the Lib Dems. Major desperately tried to keep his Eurosceptics on board and his pro-Europeans. Johnson uh, became Prime Minister in a minority parliament. And instead of doing any of that, he purged his parliamentary party of Ken Clark, Oliver Letwith, he turned the former yeah. Chancellor Philip Hammond into a near revolutionary figure by purging him. He be, Philip Hammond became our Che Guevara. Posters of Hammond are on teenagers' walls. Um, and of course, he didn't attempt to woo anybody else. And there are many other examples where Johnson has moved in a wholly different direction to all the other modern prime ministers. Um, who worked with a certain number of common assumptions of how you rule, even though each of them ruled very differently uh, and very uh, and, and in ways which were complex. Many of them were more miserable than they seemed. They found it more difficult than they could dare to admit. And that's why the caricatures needed to be explored and filled out. So anyway, there are a few opening thoughts. Thank you for listening to that. And now we can have a wider discussion. Philip. Thanks, Steve. Um, it was a splendid review of your, um, you know, the, the scope of your book, um, uh, which I have to say is it's full of these magnificent little vignettes, little descriptions of, um, of, of the pros and, pros and cons of style of each of the prime ministers. Um, one of the strong themes which you've touched on in your remarks is uh, the issue of the, your, your idea of the prime minister as a political teacher. Is this about something more than just spinning the right story around uh, you, the policies that you want to undertake? Um, it, I'd like you to unpack it a bit because it sounds a bit de haut en bas. It sounds, you know, like the prime minister's job is to tell those people out there who don't know anything um, what, uh, how, 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 how to govern the country. So could you just explain it a bit more? Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's not, I mean, spin. Uh, is has become pejorative and with some justification. Spin is about presenting the government in the best possible light, often by distorting, sometimes by lying, just to keep the, uh, the message going in a sort of glowing light as best you can. This is much deeper. It's about deciding for yourself, first of all, what your mission is as a leader, how that relates to your party, and then how it relates to the wider electorate, and to take everybody with you. Um, and it's not about saying, um, uh, you know, uh, 
what's an example of spin? I mean, there's, oh, well, you know, yesterday, for example, Boris Johnson said, we'll all flourish in January with um, a no deal Brexit. Now that is kind of, that's not an explanation. It's not going deep with the, the why are you doing this? It's a kind of spin, shallow messaging. Um, but the why as to why, say, Blair repositioned the Labour Party, why Thatcher repositioned the Tory party and adopted uh, what some argued were, uh, with justification was could have been counterproductive. And actually, Thatcher didn't stick with monetarism for that long. She pretended to. Um, she, she, more than any of the others, loved this area of explanation. She loved debating with uh, pretty tough interviewers, exploring why these things were necessary, why she was uh, addressing her antagonism towards the state. And her opponents on the Labour side, there were arguments they could have used, but they couldn't deal with this why question. Why do they disagree with her that when the state gets off our backs in inverted commas? people feel liberated, that's her argument. And they fell into the trap of um, letting her say, oh, they just want to take back your freedoms. Now, this is all simplistic explanation, but it, 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 it allows a leader to take people to unlikely and unexpected places, I think. So it's much more than spin. Well, that's a relief to hear um, because uh... One of the issues I think that we face currently is the impoverishment of political debate, um, partly because of the way in which both the media and social media tend to treat these issues, Absolutely. which is why your book is so refreshing, actually. Okay. <laughs> um, now, um, uh, our great, I, 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 I wanted to ask you to what extent you think um, being a great prime minister can be learned. Is it, is it sort of purely about a mixture of character and context? Um, or can you actually learn techniques which would assist you? Um, yes, I think you can learn. Um, it's a classic Blair quote I'm about to give, um, which sounds profound and isn't as profound as it sounds. Whereas he, he says the irony of being a prime minister is you arrive with little experience, but huge amounts of goodwill. Um, but you haven't got the experience to do the things that the goodwill would allow you to do. You end knowing precisely what you want to do with the experience, but you've lost all the goodwill and therefore haven't got the space to do it. Um, that is too simplistic. Um, but I think there are examples of prime ministers um, learning from their previous uh, careers as cabinet ministers. I think on the whole, to take Thatcher again, some of her simplistic radical instincts were tempered by her own experience as a cabinet minister in a spending department where she fought quite hard to get increases in spending. So when as prime minister she became uh, this passionate, you know, public spending is bad, kind of simplistic uh, figure, she was held back a bit by the fact that she was education secretary asking for increased public spending. Um, and so I think ministerial experience is good. And I think some of the mistakes both Blair and Cameron made as prime ministers can be explained by their total lack of ministerial experience. Some of them, but not many, learn from being prime minister. But there's something, there's a very kind of Shakespearean twist or a film noir twist, which is many don't. Many make mistakes and then make the same mistake again, as if a character cannot move away from the doom that is their destiny. I think we're seeing this with Johnson at the moment, um, who responded very slowly to the COVID situation in February and early March, and then was tormented by it. Johnson is self-aware enough to know he responded too late. Um, but... Sage recommended tougher action in September. What did he do? He didn't follow it. Um, so he's repeating the same cycle. And he's by no means alone in that. Prime ministers 
turned to the past and are drawn to dangerous places um, for reasons which are deep and psychological. Well, you've mentioned just now Johnson and the pandemic, and I have a question from Kevin. Um, uh, you, you are, in fact, pretty scathing in your book about Johnson's handling of the, of the PR, if you like, around the pan pandemic. Um, how do you feel, uh, is, uh, Kevin asks, uh, would uh, uh, previous prime ministers have handled the pandemic from a PR perspective? Would any of those in power, you know, say during the previous 20 years, have done it any better than he's done? I don't think it is uh, the PR. I, I think it is about focus, um, a, a sense of how government works. And now this is not entirely his fault. He only got this big majority in January, uh, sorry, December of last year. Um, he used it to get through the Brexit withdrawal bill. And he had no idea that this was coming. And it came at a point where he hadn't been prime minister for a, a year. Um, but Others, um, in fact, all of them, to be honest, would have had a greater sense of what levers to pull, of the seriousness of the situation, and would have been following it obsessively from certainly February, if not January. I mean, to take Theresa May, uh, she was, I think, the poorest communicator of the prime ministers, but had a capacity for detail and was across things. So I think she would have been more aware of what needed to be done and understood the structures of government more than he did. So for example, I don't think Boris Johnson fully understood that he in number 10 or even the health secretary could pull levers and it was as simple as that. In other words, he didn't understand the restructuring that took place in the first term of this government. Uh, the establishment of NHS England, Public Health England, and so on. Now, I think most of the others would do. Uh, I think that most of the others, indeed all of the others, would have focused much earlier on on building up testing and so on. So it is about detail and command of uh, detail and understanding how to govern. Remember with Johnson, he was Foreign Secretary, wholly marginalised by Theresa May and didn't really have a great deal of policy implementation on his patch. And before that was London Mayor. He hasn't really had any, and before that a journalist, a very poor preparation for governing, I can tell you. Um, so facing the biggest crisis since 1945, new to number 10, Brexit on his plate and about 10,000 personal issues to resolve. Um, uh, he was ill-suited for this post. I think all the others, I mean, Wilson was a great master of detail at his peak, not by the end. Uh, I think all the others would have responded uh, more speedily. Um, and there would still have been a nightmare. You know, this is not an issue that avoids darkness, but I think they would all have been more effective. Uh, now, sticking with Johnson, um, um, here's a question which um, illustrates sort of certain ambivalence about him. Um, um, the question is, is Johnson's disregard of the usual leadership qualities a calculated strategy by him or just the usual disorganised chaos? There is this uh, 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 difficulty, I think, in reading Johnson, knowing how much of it's um, you know, um, a put on show. Um, and how much of its actual um, dysfunction within number 10? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. And it, it, I mean, I, I, I don't fully know, to be honest. I used to do a programme with him on Radio 4. We jointly presented. And I got the impression he was a curious mix of chaotic, self-absorbed. Before we went into the studio, he hardly said anything and to anyone. And I think it was partly shyness, partly self-absorption. Um, but then when the programme started, he was brilliant and focused and uh, stylish. Um, and I think so it's partly calculated, uh, driven by his special advisor. We haven't come on to prime ministers and special advisors. But Dominic Cummings is unquestionably the most powerful special advisor in number 10. And I think uh, Boris Johnson thinks he's a genius 
and uh, drives him to be very different in style from other prime ministers. He almost, if he follows Cummings' approach, he is going to be unique um, amongst all these prime ministers. Uh, so it is partly a consequence of Brexit. He has, I think, the gen. I don't buy this thing. He doesn't know what he's doing there. He has an agenda which is uh, the most radical of all the prime ministers, including Thatcher. The broad agenda. Brexit in itself is a near revolution. Um, so all of that is a product of some thought. But there is no question he is chaotic. He has a short attention span, which is why he opted to write columns. You get that, you know, he used to write about two hours and then move on to other things. Um, so it is a mixture of uh, chaos. It's, it's a number 10. It's, if you, it is unique in that he really did, on the whole, bring his uh, entourage who had worked on the Vote Leave campaign into number 10. So it's a, a number 10 who knows how to win a referendum. Um, although you can debate about how they were pivotal or whether it was always going to be lost, but with no real experience of how to govern. So I think it's a brilliant question and it's a combination of the two. Okay, we'll, we'll just cast a, a brief glance across the um, Atlantic because um, another question has inevitably arisen. How would you compare Johnson with Trump? But just just a, a couple of minutes on that because you could wax on about Trump for a long time. Okay, yeah, uh, okay, two minutes. Um, there are some similarities uh, and you can tell that uh, Johnson has praised Trump before he became prime minister. He said, look at Trump. Trump would have sorted Brexit out in minutes. I think there was a fascination with what he could get away with and appear to still be quite popular. Um, and Trump uh, rates Johnson and has said some very uh, nice things about Johnson. Uh, they both are products of the uh, rise of populism, which followed the 2008 crash and other things, um, but the, the, they are also different to, to, I mean, Trump would not successfully be able to edit the spectator or the equivalent in the United States. Now, even though Johnson was a largely absent editor, um, he has a range and a capacity to focus occasionally that Trump doesn't have. But I think they are products of the same kind of phenomenon, uh, which is why this election in November is so interesting. Um, if Trump is defeated heavily, big if, does that signal a, a move away from that populism or not? Um, so there's a two minute answer. <laughs> and thank you for that. And, and um, um, just to, to um, uh, linger on the question of who wins the American presidential election, another query that's come in, will a Biden victory be bad for Brexit? And will a Trump defeat be damaging for similar populist leaders worldwide? Yeah, another great question. I mean, I think a Biden victory... Uh, the number 10 at the moment are, are they, they think Biden's going to win. So they, to go back to that term spinning, they are spinning. Uh, they're wholly relaxed about a Biden win. In some ways, it would be pretty good for them. Uh, he's a more stable character, a special relationship, blah, blah, blah. Um, but what is clear from Biden's public comments is he's no fan of Johnson. He compared him openly a couple of times to uh, Trump, um, and there will be a question mark about the trade deal uh, and Biden's priority. He was uh, Obama's deputy when Obama said Britain goes to the back of the queue for a trade deal if it leaves the European Union. He's openly criticized this uh, proposition to break the law uh, over the Irish protocol. Um, so I think this US trade deal, which they ache for in number 10, as the great reward for Brexit, uh, becomes almost impossible if Biden wins. By the way, it will still be difficult if Trump wins. He's not doing this out of altruism. He wants a good deal for America. <laughs>
Uh, and on the other point, yeah, I think a defeat for Trump, if, if it's quite substantial, will signal a move away. It's bound to, you know, the biggest democracy elected Trump, the biggest democracy turns away from Trump, I think will have wider implications for uh, populism. Um, I'd like to sort of widen the perspective a bit now and, and, and ask, uh, take a couple of more general questions which have come, um, not focused on particular, you know, current politicians. And one is about um, the Labour Party and, and simply why has it never had a female leader, let alone a woman prime minister? Yeah, uh, it's really interesting. I'm doing, I'm currently writing a sequel to... Um, uh, the Prime Ministers, which is the Prime Ministers we never had. And one of the challenges of the book is, to be honest, the Prime Ministers we've never had have uh, all been men because the Tories have elected two female Prime Ministers. And to be a Prime Minister, you have to be leader of the opposition or in the cabinet and you just go straight in. And Labour don't elect women. Um, so although I'm doing a chapter on Barbara Castle and possibly one or two others, it is pushing it a bit because Labour haven't elected a woman. Um, now, I think it's twofold. One is uh, the women who might have had a chance, uh, never, it didn't cross their mind to go for it. So, you know, they've had two uh, deputies, Margaret Beckett and Harriet Harman. And Harriet Harman to this very day wonders why as deputy, she didn't stand for the leadership when Labour lost in 2010, but she didn't. So they didn't have the opportunity to elect her. Margaret Beckett did stand, but it was in 1994 when Tony Blair was walking on water and she never had a chance. So the reasons are partly, um, which is bad, the lack of, there's clearly the women in the Labour Party aren't encouraged to think of themselves in terms of national leadership or haven't. Um, and, 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 and opportunity and context. There aren't that many Labour leadership contests. Uh, Labour leaders, when elected, tend to last quite a long time. And, um, and then, I mean, this one is a classic example. Quite a few women in the campaign uh, but the Labour Party, having lost so often, chose the figure who conveyed the authority, perhaps, to win an election. So it's partly that the women haven't had the confidence to really go for it. Partly the vacancy comes up very rarely. And when it has done, there has been a kind of starry or apparently starry male candidate who they turn to every time. Thank you. On the, on the subject of women prime ministers, of course, Jacinda Ardern has just won a landslide victory in New Zealand. Um, and there's a question which has come in asking, does that say something about the potential of empathy and kindness to reach electorates? It sort of implies that in the UK we haven't seen much of that recently. Yeah, she's a good example, by the way, of a teacher. I mean, if you've seen her being interviewed about COVID, why... They shut down very strictly at first. Why, why, why she was doing it. And she does convey genuinely empathy. It has to be sincere. You can't affect it or mock it. Um, and uh, I, I think that does explain, I mean, it's, an, it's a small country, but it's an astonishing win to win a majority under a pretty tough PR system. Um, is, I think, a triumph for those characteristics and others, actually. Um, I mean, she hasn't just talked about it. She has, to some extent, to largely so far, delivered on uh, COVID. Um, so, yeah, I think they are characteristics that uh, matter. And I think it comes under this political teacher bracket. Do you think, um, does, does ethics matter at all um, uh, in the way, i.e., the way in which the Prime Minister conducts themselves do you, you talk about one at one point about the importance of um in the context of the prime minister as political teacher um uh, of the importance of the prime minister talking about values are these ethical values you're talking about or are they more about sort of ideological principles if you like 
Well, it has to be. I mean, I, I know this is this was your area um, uh, when you got to know some. I had to get five ministers. <laughs> I had um, to get. I had to get a reference to ethics in somewhere. Um, yes. <laughs> And I think the ethics you have in mind are slightly different to the ones I was trying to talk about, although it, they're obviously uh, fundamental. Um, I was sort of talking about how um, for politics to, to, to function properly, you can't just have a bunch of technocratic people saying, uh, having a debate about competence, although Labour leaders choose competence because that is a way that they've tended to win, say this Tory government's incompetent. They don't often win on ideological grounds. But ideology is important or else politics becomes sort of just a debate about who rearranges the debt chairs better. Um, and that is about ideas and values, um, which place some on the left of centre, some on the right of centre, some on a kind of, uh, you know, nationalist, route and I think they are all interesting and important and a successful leader has to link those values to policies. If policies come out of a vacuum uh, we're going to do this. I mean classic example with Labour at the last election uh, there's a perfectly good route to this policy where John McDonnell announced free broadband for everybody. It came out of nothing whereas it should have been you know a sequence of events beginning with values and ideology. In terms of your area, uh, Philip, you're better qualified to reflect on the ethical qualities in terms of integrity and the uh, a, a dedicated following of the rules. Um, but I think what they all do is they begin, all of them, with the possible exception of Boris Johnson, who has quite openly flouted that he wants to break the law, international law, which uh, relates to uh, his own withdrawal agreement. They um, suspended parliament in a way that was deemed unlawful. But I think they all begin thinking they won, partly because the previous government uh, was mired in questions about integrity. Remember the John Major era sleaze? Well, you remember it very well. Um, and then uh, and then Blair comes in and says, not only are we going to be purer than pure, if anyone is not seen as purer than pure, they're out, uh, which is a very high bar. Um, so they all begin with this, but the complexities of ruling um, mean, as you know better than anyone, there are lapses that have to be, at the very least, investigated. Indeed. Indeed they do, <laughs> usually with <laughs> dire consequences. <laughs> yeah, um, a, a more general um, question now, um, which begins with thanks for the talk and indeed for the book, um, and goes on, does the rise of popularist movements pose a threat to democracy and has been manipulation and deception replaced truth-telling, scrutiny, and honest dialogue and debate, which sort of relates to what we were touching on a moment yeah. ago. There has always been. I mean, politics is partly uh, a battle between two sides, or sometimes more than two sides, um, in which arguments are deployed uh, which are contentious, which have been spun, but what I say to that is better to resolve disputes that way than through force. You either resolve disputes through killing people or through politics. So that means truth becomes um, a very complicated concept. Um, you know, the, it, there's an endless debate and one person's truth can be another person's untruth. Um, and I don't think there was a period where two sides were battling it out as if it was a sort of academic seminar where they were sort of agreeing on common truths. Uh, you know, there, were, there have always been uh, this kind of conflict between sides, which, and people have to kind of find out where their sense of truth lies. And it will depend partly on their own views, their own backgrounds, the context and so on. In terms of the rise of populism, I think this has led to an extraordinary dialogue with the electorate where um, 
lies are accepted and go, they don't go unchallenged. So for example, the Trump lies, I mean, the media in the United States are onto them. I, I forget, you know, I watch CNN a lot at the moment because American politics is so gripping. And I forget how much freedom they have to attack Trump. And the BBC could not get away with the CNN reporting of Trump. So they are scrutinized, but certainly in this period since 2008, where there has been a complete collapse of trust in institutions, politics, banks, um, and all the related kind of consequences of that, um, the populists have, I mean, so th their arguments are really dangerous. They basically said, these elected politicians have betrayed all of you. You can't trust any of them. We're coming in. We don't know anything about, about this. And that's an advantage, as I mentioned about Trump. Um, if you think about it, what they're saying is democratic politics is hopeless, really, even though they are engaging with it and being elected through it. They're basically saying, you've been betrayed by all of them. Elect a load of outsiders who know nothing about it and we'll sort it out. And of course, they they find it's a bit more complicated. Now, um, reach for your uh, your crystal ball, OK, your um, your your, your um, political uh, insider with um, real insight. Um, but look in the crystal ball, which may be a little cloudy. Um, a couple of questions which are essentially about uh, Boris Johnson's future. Um, one asks, can he recover from the current situation? Um, and there's another, with a, 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 along with another one, is asking, you know, is he going to be around in uh, six months' time? Uh, is he likely to serve a full term? So, um, are you prepared to prognosticate? <laughs> with, with huge uh, hes hesitation. Uh, I, I, when I first looked at the prime ministers we never had, this was before Johnson was prime minister, I concluded he would be in that list. All the reasons they didn't get the top job, which they ate for, Hesseltine, Dennis Healy, um, you know, Portillo and all that. He, he had the qualifications not to get it. And I wrote a column along those lines and two years later he got it. So he, he often defies trends and as I say, assumptions about leadership. Um, but what I would say is that of all the prime ministers I looked at, and you could go much further back, uh, only one uh, planned his departure and did so wholly voluntarily. And that was Harold Wilson, um, who reached 60, he had planned to go at 60, and he went. On the whole, all the others, although finding it hellish, did not want to let go. They always assumed or dared to hope things would get a bit better. So I assume he will um, stay on there um, and won't go voluntarily. Now, the Tory party is quite capable of getting rid of a prime minister who they see as a liability. So that might happen. But we're not there yet because he still has the extended goodwill of winning an election less than a year ago. Now, that goodwill is fading. Um, but I suppose that's my way of answering that the chances are that he will stay on rather than go. And I don't think, by the way, he's uh, seriously ill. I think he's got the most ridiculous amount of pressures, including quite a few private pressures uh, around him. But as the cabinet minister said to me with a kind of mischievous look, I can assure you that Boris Johnson we're dealing with now is precisely the same Boris Johnson we were dealing with before he got the virus. Now, I don't think that was going to be wholly flattering or wholly reassuring, but I don't think it will be the fact that he's ill that means he will go in the next six months. So I think the chances are he'll still be around for, he's got a majority of over 80, so I suspect he'll be around for a bit longer. I won't, I won't expect you to answer another question, which is, um, you know, who's going to succeed him? I think we're a little way off being able to predict that. So uh, uh, well, you probably bed, agree. A, a lot of people are saying that if he does go, um, it will be a battle between Rishi Sunak, who, by the way, it's very interesting with chancellors. Nearly all of them have a period where they appear to be walking on water, but then become more unpopular. Uh, but they assume Rishi Sunak, 
uh, Michael Gove, who has tried twice and still wants, wants it. And Jeremy Hunt, I know, aches to get it. Uh, he's on the back benches and he will try and pretend that he would represent a new new kind of face. Well, he, that's not the case. He was in the cabinet for ages. Um, but those are the three being talked about. If Johnson went in, in, in total chaos, and the possibility for total chaos is obviously there with these two uh, forces, COVID and Brexit, coming together in January. But to go back to my earlier answer, only Wilson has left voluntarily. Moving um, uh, you've on to another aspect of the Johnson prime ministership, you've mentioned um, uh, uh, earlier Dominic Cummings in passing. Um, we've had a question, um, actually a number of questions around the position of, um, of um, unelected advisers the extent to which prime ministers are become dependent upon them or are dependent upon them. Um, and um, in, that in particular, um, that's been put in the context of the current Johnson prime ministership. But I know in your book, actually, you, um, you look, for example, at the, um, implicate, the impact um, on uh, Theresa May's time of her advisers um, yeah. and yeah. the extent of, to which prime ministers overworked, you know, rushing from one thing to the other, dependent on others to see them through the day, let alone through a you know, the year and a parliament, um, are dependent on people around them is something which you might just briefly explore. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's the most interesting relationship in British politics, because with prime ministers, quite a lot of the cabinet, they have very little room for manoeuvre. Um, even Johnson, who was brutal with cabinet reshuffles, um, even Blair, I mean, you know, he wanted to get rid of Gordon Brown at one point and couldn't and didn't, rightly, actually. Um, but the, the their special advisor, the kind of key figure in number 10, they choose. And each choice tells us a huge amount about them. And they all become really dependent on this figure. The Theresa May thing is a fascinating example. Um, Nick Timothy uh, really was Theresa May's kind of ideological propeller. Uh, without him, she really didn't quite know what she was doing or why, that why question. Nick Timothy was a very interesting uh, figure in the Conservative Party, I think more interesting than Cummings. He was a curious mix of Ed Miliband and Enoch Powell. He had a kind of Midlands... Uh, nationalism, very pro-Brexit, um, but he believed much more than Cameron and Osborne in the state and got May to say things like, uh, it's time for us to celebrate the good things the state can do uh, and that markets don't always work. So it was a very interesting mix, but then she had to sack him when she lost the party's overall majority in the 2017 election, the Tory party turned on Nick Timothy and her other advisor, Fiona Hill. And after that, she was lost. She really didn't know, apart from Brexit, why she was there. And Cummings is fascinating. When we had the famous Barnard Castle eye test scandal and Johnson didn't sack him, lots of people said, what has Cummings got on Johnson? You know, what scandal will he break to the world if Johnson sacks him? That's not why he stayed. Um, we all, all know there's loads of scandals around Johnson. And like Trump, he seems to be able to get away with them. He kept Cummings because he is similarly dependent on him. Um, Johnson is not fully clear why he's there. He's always wanted to be there. He's not fully clear what kind of figure he is. Is he a Keynesian? Is he a sort of Osborne, Sunak, uh, balance books, treasury culture. He claims to be both. Roosevelt one minute, Churchill the next. <coughs> Cummings is this driving radical disruptor with Gove. And he thinks Cummings is a genius, Johnson. He thinks Cummings delivered the Brexit referendum, delivered the December election win, sorted out the nightmare of that hung parliament from his perspective, and got Brexit done, in inverted commas. So uh, Tony Blair was very dependent on Alistair Campbell. And Alistair Campbell wasn't that interested in policy, but as you know, he 
had a feel for the media and the rhythm of news, which Blair once said to me. So I think Alistair's a genius. He can tell me how long a news story is going to last, how damaging it will be. And Blair, because of his obsession with the media, came, couldn't really do without it. And when Alistair Campbell resigned from uh, Number 10, if you read Campbell's diaries, they are fascinating. Blair was on the phone to him the next day and every day that followed. So it's a really interesting and complex uh, relationship that the Prime Minister and their top advisor. There's a future book in, in, in that. Um, and of course, that adds to the mix, um, the permanent civil servant um, officials who are, who are advising them closely as well. Um, as you know, around the Prime Minister, it's very much becomes like a court. Yes. Um, in some and can be dangerously so. Um, uh, and that's why you do, frankly, need independent outsiders who've got some professional loyalty and commitment to something other than pure politics and the party. Absolutely. But that's an, an ex civil servant speaking there. <laughs> yeah, no, I, well, I completely agree. But as you, you'll have noted, uh, um, with this uh, number 10, you know, they, they tend to get rid of the top civil servants if they mm -hmm. disapprove. Um, so they don't really want that kind of independent advice, is the impression I've got. Okay. Now, time is moving on. So I've just got um, w uh, uh, perhaps a sort of semi-local question, in a sense. Um, it's really um, uh, around uh, Scottish independence, the prospect for it. Um, let me read this. There are a number of come in on this along this line, but it, I'll take this one. Nicola Sturgeon is a teacher with empathy and has been at huge pains to explain issues about COVID, which has won a support in Scotland. How do you see post-COVID UK, united or with Scottish independence, perhaps in the Northern Ireland following because of the EU border, Irish border of situ, situation and so on? So perhaps a brief comment on that. Another brilliant uh, question. I, I agree with you. I think Sturgeon is an example of a political teacher. If you watch her news conferences compared with Johnson, you can see that. Um, it seems to me in a way that is fascinating, and I'll just do it in a minute because I know we're running out of time, that COVID has exposed for good or for bad um, the degree to which power was rebalanced um, post-1997. Um, it is, if you think about it, the news stories of recent days and weeks would have been literally impossible before 1997. There were no elected mayors in Greater Manchester and London. There was no Scottish Parliament. There was no Welsh Assembly, no Northern Ireland Assembly. And so COVID has revealed the degree to which um, power had been, albeit in a kind of quite sort of ill thought through way, it was all very patchwork. Um, but power is, is different. So you can have a control freakery number 10, who suddenly find, well, hold on, Scotland's doing it different. Wales is doing it differently. Oh, Burnham in Manchester won't accept what we're saying. And this has changed the dynamics, I think, of power. And COVID has not only highlighted this, but actually to answer the question very precisely, I think uh, reinforced and fueled deep divisions. And it is clear, I'm not saying it's, it's obvious, that one of the things that's fueled is greater support for independence in Scotland. I think it's doing other things in England too, uh, in terms of where power does lie and should lie. Well, the questions are continuing to pour in, um, Steve. So if you're willing to give us a little bit more time, another five minutes, 10 minutes or so max, um, yeah. then we can perhaps get through a few more. Um, and I know people watching will be very grateful. Um, um, here's um, here's a, a, a challenging question about um, uh, your view about uh, political leaders um, as teachers. Um, the question, um, posed is whether the electorate of today would listen to the long explanations and whys in an age of instant gratification. In short, have we moved beyond the stage at which the electorate um, uh, um, uh, are willing to listen for very long? Yeah, that's another pretty question. I don't think so. And it's one of the frustrations I have with the BBC, where I remember once being on as a pundit on the Today programme on Radio 4. It was 
um, it was just after the 2008 crash. And John Humphrey said, has the 2008 crash changed the way we see democracy in Britain and perhaps the entire Western world? Joining me is Steve Richards of The Independent, as I was then, and Matthew Dancona of The Spectator. Um, and then he, I looked at the clock and it was three minutes to nine. And so he asked Matthew a question, he answered it, and I said, I do think 2008, all the assumptions have been uh, turned on their head and author. Steve, thank you very much, we've run out of time, and that was it. And the BBC kind of works on the assumption, uh, which is why book festivals are so great, that people have, it's so patronizing, an attention span of two minutes. And nothing gets explored in any uh, depth. And I think there is a huge appetite, actually, for things longer than that uh, across the whole range of people, demographics, uh, age groups. Um, but, you, you know, I yeah, I do think that. But you're right to raise the issue because Twitter is such an easy hit, you know, and I'm hooked on Twitter. I'm on it all the time. Um, and, and yet you can't obviously delve deep in a few few words that Twitter allows. Um, but I think there is a hunger out there for trying to make sense of things, a hunger for debate. Uh, and, and that, by the way, is an interesting and a sort of positive thing about the rise of some of the so-called populists. It, it reflects a sort of appetite for some kind of engagement, you know, thousands packing out to see Jeremy Corbyn or, you know, risking their lives to see Trump when he's got COVID suggests a kind of appetite that might be a misdirect, you know, well, attending Trump with COVID is clearly misdirected on many different levels. But yeah, so to answer it, I do think there is an appetite for going beyond the, the superficial uh, and across all ages but you have to do it in a way which gets attention. And that's a challenge. And the media has wholly failed in that respect, as have some politicians. Um, one issue that's been raised in questions is, and it goes back to the, 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 the question of how you learn to be a successful prime minister. Um, uh, one question that's been raised relating to that in a way is whether it's a value to um, have had a career prior to um, uh, your political career. I mean, one of the, uh, to, in, to my eyes, changes of politics over recent um, decades has been the rise of a, a sort of political class, if you like, who've um, gone from reading politics at university and student politics to being a local councillor to then being a special advisor to, um, a, to an MP or a minister, and then backbench MP and then a minister, and not had any experience outside. So, uh, do you think that's an important factor in in the way in which we are currently, you know, rearing our political class? I, I certainly think that's the majority view, and I bet the people watching will take your view. Philip, I, my view is that given what I said at the beginning about how complicated uh, the vocation of politics is, even at a lower level, and how massively complicated political leadership is, I don't think it's necessarily the case that being uh, immersed in some other world is good preparation for it. And it was, was interesting whenever, I mean, Blair and Cameron, um, to some extent, Thatcher were very keen on bringing business leaders in. Um, and most of them really struggled with um, all the political demands unique to politics. So I don't think it is necessarily the case or the solution to uh, more effective leadership is um, having worked in other fields. But I, I think most people take your view. Okay, well, it's the view that um, was implied in the question which had been put about, uh, um, and uh, perhaps there's a happy medium to be struck here um, between political um, experience and the credibility 
as well as the understanding of people and situations which can come from having occupied a senior role in, an, in, a, in another setting. Um, to begin to draw things to a close, um, uh, you say in the conclusion um, of your book, there is a leadership crisis in the United Kingdom. The demands of leadership are high. The bar, and that is the bar in terms of the quality of those aspiring to be prime minister, is set low. And your book charts, if I may say so, you know, that you come out of it feeling that what you've observed or been privileged to um, to see an analysis of is a long and steady decline in the quality of political leadership with the occasional upward blip. Um, it's clear that you think that some people were more successful than others. But on the whole, the last 20 years, perhaps, not terribly impressive. Maybe uh, maybe I'm being unfair the last 15 years. I'm going on the tone as much as anything um, of your account in the book of the different prime ministers. Well, so yeah. I guess my question is, why, why do you think we've got to this point and what can we do to reverse the trend? I don't know, but uh, I know there is a problem. Let, to give one example, the we in the 70s, uh, I mentioned Harold Wilson, the only one to resign voluntarily. The leadership contest, uh, the candidates were Callaghan, who won, uh, Roy Jenkins, Tony Crossland, Dennis Healy, um, uh, Michael Foote, Tony Benn. I mean, these were all, whatever you think of their politics, recognisably huge figures. Um, the Labour leadership contest in 20. Uh, was uh, Andy Burnham, Yvette Cooper, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, who won, and I, I can't even remember some of the others. Now, you know, I'm a great admirer of some of those people, but you can see that they're not in the same league. And in the, the, the Tory contest in 2005, after three defeats, David Cameron, David Davis, I mean, these are not in the same league as uh, Thatcher versus Willie Whitelaw versus Heath in 75. And whatever you think of their politics, they are just measurably bigger figures than Cameron, who I think was a very shallow, underdeveloped figure. Um, and David Davis, too. Um, so... Uh, now, why that has happened is an interesting question. I'm not wholly sure, um, but I think it is partly the criteria when we elect MPs um, wholly legitimately. I think these days is much more about their commitment to the local community um, than their potential to be a huge figure in government, which is not necessarily the same thing. So I think in this era, it would have been hard, say, for Dennis Healy, Michael Foote, Tony Croston to get seats because they got seats in areas where they weren't uh, from. Um, now, that might be a good thing because it does create a sort of a range of MPs, range of voices representing local communities, um, but maybe they're not necessarily the same qualities required for these titanic demands of leadership um but i so, so maybe that's part of the reason but i think there are there are just a lack of really big figures in politics um at the moment i mean starmer might uh, uh grow into one he's 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 got this talk about different careers he's been dpp director public prosecutions i think that gives him a self-confidence that quite a few leaders of the opposition have lacked um but let's see. It's a very well, um, cabinet, I think, at the moment, for example. You know, whatever your policy. The one, the one thing we can be sure of, Steve, is that you're not going to be out of a job. There'll be plenty to commentate on and to analyse and write books about in, in, the, in the future. Um, as you will have guessed, um, we've reached the end of our time. Um, and I'm sorry to all those people who've asked questions that haven't we haven't been able to reach, but we've been... Uh, through a goodly number of them. And Steve, that's thanks to you for your willingness to continue. And um, you've given us some immensely thoughtful and thought-provoking answers to uh, the various questions which have been 
put. I want to encourage everybody watching to uh, to buy the book. Um, and uh, you can get it from uh, Greaves in Berwick if you're living uh, locally, but also, of course, anywhere. Uh, and there is a reputable bookseller and online um, as well. Um, it's a fascinating and an eye-opening read. Um, finally, just a word or two to those um, who've been watching about Berwick's Literary Festival. The festival is run entirely by volunteers um, and it's supported by local people and businesses. We don't get any... Um, arts or government body funding. And if you've enjoyed the session, then please show your appreciation by donating via the online facility, a link to which will appear on your screen shortly. The eighth Berwick Festival um, is going to be held from the 14th to the 17th of October next year. Um, I'm looking forward very much to seeing you again there when hopefully we'll all be able to meet in person. Um, for now, um, thank you again, Steve, on behalf of everyone um, who's participated. And thank you to all of you who are watching wherever you may be. Go well and stay safe. And good night from berwick on tweed where Scotland meets England and where the River Tweed meets the sea. Good night, all. Thank you. Thank you.